morning. My name is Brighton. We're so glad to worship with you here at King Street Church as we serve and follow Jesus. We are excited to say that today is Local Partner Sunday. Throughout the service, we will be highlighting our partner ministries that serve in and around Franklin County. Pastor Adam Keith will be sharing a message from our sermon series, Are You Ready? from the Gospel of Mark. As part of Local Partner Sunday, we wanna draw your attention to two events that are coming up for Network Ministries and Monarch's Way. Both of these ministries serve vulnerable young people, seeking to equip them with life skills and a knowledge of God and His Word. We have heard from many of our partners that they are low on financial support. Consider investing in an enjoyable evening of celebration that will enable these ministries to carry on God's work in our community. See the worship folder for dates and details. Easter is just a few weeks away, and as usual, we have a week of events planned to help us remember Christ's sacrifice for us. We will hold a service on Monday, Thursday to commemorate the Last Supper and the share in communion. This year on Good Friday, Pastor Adam Keith and Pastor Rob Gunkelman are leading an in-person Stations of the Cross experience. And of course, on Sunday, March 31st, we will look forward to an all-out celebration of Christ's resurrection and his victory over sin and death. We hope you will mark your calendars and plan to participate in some of these special Easter events. We would love to connect with you. If you are joining us for the first time, we invite you to come up after the service to speak with a pastor or text NEW to 717-401-7777. Our announcements can be found in the printed worship folder or at kingstreetchurch.com slash today. We are grateful for the chance to worship God with you today. It is our prayer that this year we will grow in our relationship with Christ so that we can experience the abundant life that he has planned for us. Well, good morning again. For the third time, good morning. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to happen, so I got caught by surprise there. It is so good to see you all here this morning and to, again, worship the Lord together. I always look forward to Sundays and to coming together like this. Would you stand and greet one another this morning? Say welcome to somebody. Oh, did they? Okay. Good. It's always good to see you fellowship together among yourselves and to welcome one another to the church. That's just a great sight to behold from here. I'm going to read a passage here from Matthew 7 and another, uh, actually, and, and then Psalm 95. Listen to these words. Everyone then who bears these words of mine and does them will be like a, ma a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and it beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, floods came, and the wind blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. 
And then Psalm 95 says, So let's, uh, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Let's sing. Everyone singing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
seated. Well, I'd say good morning, but it's been done three times, so <laughs> happy St. Patrick's Day. We'll go there. Hey, one of the uh, things we do here at King Street Church is our mission is to bless and engage the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so one of the ways that we do that is by partnering with 19 local partner ministries. And we have a video that's just kind of celebrating everything that's going on in those ministries. Hey, my name is Andy Simbala, and I work on staff with Disciple Makers, which serves college students. I'm Stephanie Zewarth, and I'm with Joyelle Generation and Joyelle Camps and Retreats. Hello, King Street. I'm Craig Newcomer, and this is... Carrie Gordon. Hello, my name is Mark, and I work for Habitat for Humanity of Franklin County. Hello, I'm Major Chris Mock with the Salvation Army here in Chambersburg. Hi, my name is Dan Baker, and I work with Cross Ministries. I'm Sue Sellers. I'm the Assistant Program Director of She Somebody's Daughter, I'm Deb McCaskill, and I'm the Client Services Director at Pregnancy Ministries. Hello, I, my name is Barb Johns, and I am the Director at the House of Grace in Chambersburg. So I have the privilege of working for Disciple Makers, and King Street has been partnering with the work that God is doing, particularly at Shippensburg University, for over a decade now, which is amazing. And God has done a lot in the past decade up at Shippensburg. Um, our ministry is focused on the Great Commission. Jesus says in Matthew 28 to go make disciples of all nations. And we're trying to fulfill that Great Commission with a really small slice of right there on college campuses with students. I am just thrilled to share with you that God is blessing the ministry both numerically and of course more significantly with spiritual fruit. Just last ministry year we had 584 children that we know of begin relationships with Jesus Christ and since the new ministry year has started which was just September 1st we know of 254 so far it's just amazing to think of that and that does not even account for the immeasurable discipleship that's happening across all our programs. One of the biggest things we do at our food pantry is we partner with once more ministries every quarter so we partnership and bring 300 boxes to match their 300 items of hygiene and then we also have the cold weather shelter <clears throat> where two of your parishioners sit on our board of directors at the cold weather shelter and um, we have Wednesday night is the volunteer night for King for Street, King Street, for yes. King Street. Mm -hmm. and that partnership has been going on a long time I've been at the shelter since 2006 and King Street's been there ever since 
Our mission statement is seeking to put God's love into action. Habitat brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. And it's the middle part of our mission that I'd like to focus on, and that's the bringing people together. Habitat is a Christian ministry. It was part of our founding. It's part of our current identity. But there's no faith test applied to working alongside Habitat. So what that means on any given day at the job site is people of different faiths, no faiths, all working together for the same mission, and that is to eliminate substandard housing from our community. So I contend that the primary beneficiary of Habitat's ministry is actually the volunteers that get to do the work. Our founder, William Booth, um, realized shortly after we were founded that um, he couldn't really talk about the love of God. Um, if people were cold, without a home, hungry, or had cold feet. And so he started this motto called Soup, Soap, and Salvation. And we still carry that with us to this day. And we're so grateful for the Sunday school classes, which, such as Reflections, who uh, have stood kettles for us, and uh, some other Sunday school classes who have contributed financially to us, as well as the overall King Street Church that has contributed so much to our mission. So we thank you and we applaud your partnership in this community. Part of our core values across is to partner with churches in the community and to minister to the larger disabled population. And King Street Church and the LOC have been paramount in bringing that vision to life. Uh, King Street has been a faithful monthly donor as we rely on donations to cover a large part of our operating budget. King Street's hosted many coffee houses where the larger disabled community has come together uh, for a great evening of fun and laughter. We share a meal, we sing songs, and they get an opportunity to hear about God's love. We've had your youth group come out and be part of our work days and bless our residents by spending time together. Uh, these interactions are an incredible blessing to our ministry, and we can't thank King Street and the LFC enough for their involvement with Cross. So when we work with our, um, our human traffic victims um, that come forward and ask support, we come alongside them and we um, give them uh, connections for medical and for food and for churches, just a safe community to come around them and give them the options of, um, to help them. We also have trauma support and Bible studies support groups and just give them a good listening, listening ear and we all, always offer chocolate and coffee. Recently, I had a client that approached me in a store and was sharing with me that since I had prayed with her, she had seen things turn around and she said, what you prayed really worked. And I said, well, really, it's God that's at work in your life. Often when I pray with my clients, I will say that I hope God will raise up their children and they will be strong in the Lord and they will spread their faith. The women are coming together more as a group they're learning to reach out to each other and help each other, not depending on my, me or one of the other volunteers there, counselors. Um, I knew when this one lady walked in the door one morning that something went wrong in her home. She was had the look on her face. And by the time I got around to her, she was in the Bible study room and she had broken down and started to cry. And by the time I got to her, there were two other women over her from the group with their hands on her shoulders and telling her she's going to be okay and offering to pray for her. So to see them reach out, I'm going to cry now, <laughs> to see them reach out to help each other instead of focusing on themselves was a really big step. And I'm, I'm just very proud of that. Amen. Well, it takes a village to, to raise a child, and I think it takes partners like these to truly bless and engage our community with the gospel. And so it's through generosity, uh, of your generosity, that we are able to be generous with our partners and, uh, and come alongside of them in their ministry. Uh, so it's just great. We're, we're thankful for it and thankful for you guys. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, we thank you, God, for all the ministry that you're doing with each of our 19 local partners. God, it is, it is fun to see what you're doing and how you are working and, and just how you've gifted us and, and created different passions and desires to reach all facets of our community. And, and Lord, we just pray that King Street is, will never get our eyes off of that goal and that we will always be able to come alongside and partner with our partner ministries. And Lord, right now we want to pray for those people uh, in our church body who are uh, getting ready to go 
uh, through surgeries or who are recovering from, from surgeries or having procedures. Lord, we are a, a needy people and, and we know that, that you are uh, always at work. And so Lord, we would pray that you would guide the hands of the surgeons and, and of the nurses and, and just uh, help, these, help these people to, uh, to not have any anxiety, not have any stress about what they're about to go through. And Lord, personally, we want to pray for uh, Caleb Stoneham, who uh, had a motorcycle incident yesterday. Uh, he is healthy and, and doing well, but he's definitely in some pain. So God, we would pray for his, for his recovery. And uh, just we want to praise you that nothing further was uh, or damaging happened because it was a, a high speed lay down of his bike. And, and God, we also just want to pray for today that uh, as we get together with family and we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, if you're Irish or if you just want to be Irish, whatever it is, that, uh, that we just have fun, have fun with family. But more than that, God, that, uh, that our time together, that our, our voices would, would glorify you. And uh, Lord, in all these things, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Thank you, Belcoir. Very beautiful. And now stand, would you please? Just before the message this morning, there's a song I always love before a sermon is preached. Break thou the bread of life. Is that your prayer this morning, that, that God would just break his word to us this morning and give us what we need to hear? Break thou the bread of life. for that this morning that you would break your word to us help us to hear what we need to hear this morning that pastor adam would give us the, a message from you to give to us fill him with your spirit and we'll give you all the praise in jesus name i pray amen you may be seated well a, apparently good morning is off the table so i can't say that happy saint patrick's day has been stolen I was prepared with both of those greetings, and now I'm left with my third choice, which I just thought of. If my son Owen were here, he would remind us all that it's Selection Sunday for the NCAA tournament. So happy Selection Sunday. And with that, we get started. Actually, good morning. That's really what I want to say, so I'm just going to do it. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I get to share the word with you today. And you may have noticed, or at least you will by the end of, of our service today, that we are highlighting our local partner ministries on what we're calling Local Partner Sunday. And this is an area of our work here at King Street Church that I am privileged to work with. And it's a very active area of ministry in this church and around our community. But to be honest, it maybe flies under the radar just a little bit. So today, my hope and the hope of those of us who are involved in this is that we will begin to change that. This is a QR code, by the way. I know this is probably not the service that's going to use this extensively, but it's going to be up there for a while. So if you want to experiment with your phones, I mean, it's a pretty cool tool. Anyway, in a few minutes um, and with a couple of videos, there is, there's no way that I can tell you everything that there is to know about our local partners. But our prayer is that today 
that we can spur you on in at least one of the following ways. That what you learn today might lead you to pray. That what you learn today might lead you to give. And that what you learn today might lead you to serve. Now, there's no test when I'm done with this portion of the sermon. There's no special offering that we're going to take. That's not what I mean. But what I do mean is that I hope that today's highlights, you've already seen a few of them, will whet your appetite to how you can be some kind of participant to what God has laid out before us as a church as we think about missions, as we think about service, as we think about stewardship in our local community. I hope some of you will email me or call the church office or text a friend in the coming week wondering, how can I invest in that one thing that I saw on Sunday? Or what needs can I meet within that group? Or what is God's invitation for me to come alongside that particular organization? So what is a local partner ministry? What does that mean to King Street Church? Well, I'm going to try to paint a picture for you in a few minutes. First of all, and Pastor Rob already mentioned this, we have 19 local partners. That's one, nine, 19. That's not a small number of partners. And you have and you will hear from many of them today, though not all of them. But there's 19 of them, so I'm going to save us uh, the, the time of rattling off the list. But you get the idea. And for some of these partners, we are significant financial partners. We give a total budgeted amount of just under $120,000 a year spread out over these organizations. And that does not include additional funds as they come in throughout the year or they become available or giving directly by individuals who consider themselves part of the King Street family who have a heart for these various missions. And for some of these partners, we are significant prayer partners. Different folks in our congregation are praying for them as they receive needs and updates via emails and newsletters and conversations, as they sit on boards or as they serve alongside those receiving their ministry services. For some of these partners, we are an essential pathway to networking with others in their spheres of work or their spheres of influence. And this may be my favorite. Actually, I think this is my favorite. Or at least it's the most unique way that we partner with these folks. You see, every quarter, we host a meeting in which all of our partners are invited. Most of them come most of the time. Each ministry is offered space to share with the whole group ways that they have seen God at work, ways that they have experienced defeat or frustration, the needs that they have, the hopes that they see on the horizon. Now, this church, like all churches, has a lot of meetings. I mean, like, a lot of meetings, right? Some of you know this very well. <laughs> but I will put some good money on this particular partner meeting, this quarterly meeting, being the most encouraging and life-giving meeting that we do here. And you are all invited to come, to be listeners, if you want. And if you want to know when, you reach out to me, I'll let you know. I'm not going to give you those details right now. But we would love to have our church family, those of you who are not there yet, come and hear what God is doing in our community. Each quarter, it's pretty amazing to see how people who work in different spaces, maybe among college students or among the homeless, for example, or with middle and high school students, for example, how they are able to encourage one another, how they're able to find and share resources amongst one another, how they're able to support one another's needs, most importantly, how they're able to pray. A real community has developed in this space. And I'm not blowing smoke. This is not a, you know, show up if you want King Street to keep giving you money kind of thing. It's a place of solidarity and refreshment, and I believe this is a significant gift in our community. And we hear that regularly from our partners. So do we do the work of our partners? No, we don't. We come alongside them, and we support the ways they're already at work. Do we try as a church to reinvent the wheel and do our own style of ministry that's already happening? No, we don't. We recognize how God is already at work with those in the trenches, and we offer support across the community. Do we want to see our people, our King Street people, head out into the community to go it alone for Jesus? No, we don't. We want to connect those who want to serve or pray or give with those who have a mind for the diverse work of the Lord across the landscape of the wider community and partner. This is a really exciting way. In our unique position, with our unique location, and with our resources to say, hey, Chambersburg, 
Jesus' church is bigger than this church. How can we be part of it? Or to say, God, what are you already doing? How can we join you? So when you think about missions or serving or tithing, I want to encourage you to think internationally. And by saying that, I gained some points with Pastor Jay today. But I also want you to think locally. Now he owes me. A surprisingly large and varied mission field exists right outside these walls. From where I'm standing, I can actually see one right out through the back of the sanctuary doors across King Street into the ministry center where we do Agape English. We hope that today will help you see that the mission field can be experienced in new ways. And for some of you to accept an invitation from the Holy Spirit to invest in it in new ways too. So all that said, your crash course in local partner ministry at King Street Church, we're going to continue looking at Mark. And my hope is to somehow find a way to tie this all together. And when I'm done, you can tell me if I did that or not. Are you ready? It is no small task to condense this section of Mark's gospel into a few minutes. So I'm going to be up front with you. I am not even going to try this morning. But what I do want to try is to set the broader scene quickly and then focus in on a theme or two that God might want us to notice this morning. Now we are heading, we're heading toward Palm Sunday, through Holy Week, the crucifixion of Jesus, and then ultimately to Resurrection Sunday, Easter, two weeks from today. In this passage, in these chapters, in the ones that follow, events are moving quickly as Jesus moves through these days, these last days with his disciples. In chapters 8 through 10, at least once in each chapter, and remember the chapters weren't there, right? People put those in later to help us, you know, be able to preach through them a little bit easier, read them a little bit easier. But at least once in each chapter, we see that Jesus predicts his death and alludes to his coming resurrection. At least once in each chapter, we see the disciples do or say something stupid that seems so out of line with what we now know as the larger story. The third thing we see in each chapter is some lessons on following Jesus. I prefer the word apprenticeship to following or discipleship. It's, you know, it's your choice, but lessons on apprenticing Jesus into spiritual greatness. And all of these things happen through events, interactions, stories like the transfiguration, like the healing and the likely resurrection of a demon-possessed young boy, through teachings on divorce, through the story of the rich young ruler and teachings on money and possessions, the welcoming of children, another ridiculous question by some disciples, and the healing of a blind man named Bartimaeus. I mean, stuff is happening here. Stuff is moving fast. That's your Cliff Notes version. And even though I'm not going to spend much time on most of this, I do encourage you to spend time with Jesus this week in these chapters, wondering what he has for you to notice, especially as we lead up to Easter in a couple of weeks from now. Yet in all of the events that I just rattled off and all of the noise, there is a question that rises twice. It's the same exact question. It's asked by Jesus, but in two totally different scenes with two totally different responses. We haven't read it yet. Does anybody have any guesses what the question is? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? We're going to look at them both. The first is included in Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. So we'll read this first. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Jesus asked. They said, allow one of us to sit on your right and the other on your left when you enter your glory. Jesus replied, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or receive the baptism I receive? We can, they answered. Jesus said, you will drink the cup I drink and receive the baptism I receive, but to sit at my right or left isn't mine to give. It belongs to those for whom it has been prepared. Now, when the other ten disciples heard about this, they became angry with James and John. Imagine, right? I would too. Jesus called them over and said, You know that the ones who are considered the rulers by the Gentiles show off their authority over them, and their high-ranking officials order them around. But that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. 
Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man didn't come to serve, to be served, excuse me, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. So that's the first one. What do you want me to do for you? Now we're going to look at the second one, and it jumps off right into the next section of Scripture, starting in verse 46, running through 52. Some point after this, Jesus and his followers come, came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him forward. They called the blind man, be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see and he began to follow Jesus on the way. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It is, again, not too dissimilar from the angle we discussed a few weeks ago in the parable of the soils, if you remember. A question surrounding desire. What do you want me to do for you? Now, I don't want to jump quickly to the answer this morning. I want to see if we can see the heart behind the characters to whom Jesus asked this question. Okay, so that's what we're going we're to do. We're going to look at these two scenes. First is the disciples James and John. Jesus asks them this question after they say to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Again, desire. They want something. In this case, do they come with a demanding spirit? Are they feeling entitled? Do they sense their position in Jesus' inner circle gives them some kind of special privilege? I suppose you could also wonder, do they have the full trust that Jesus can do anything? Is the coming answer to Jesus' question born out of a genuine desire to be present with him, to remain with him? Now, I think it's more likely the former, as the rest of this section would indicate so in the response of the other disciples. They're really annoyed with James and John. And Jesus is teaching here on being a servant in the kingdom of God, which we just read. But wonder away, what did they come with? James and John, you and I, no one is just one thing. And that includes these, these disciples. You and I have mixed hearts, mixed emotions. There is bad mixed with our good. There is good mixed with our bad. It was the same for James and John. And I believe that recognizing this truth, this idea, and asking questions like this will help us as we encounter God's word to enter into it, to imagine it, to feel it, not just simply to analyze what it says. But for the purposes of this morning, for this message, let's agree, if we can, that James and John are approaching Jesus here with some things like entitlement or control or maybe ambition or perhaps arrogance, likely placing hope in some kind of status. Jesus knows this. He knows their hearts. And what does he do? He asks a question, and then he offers grace and hope and instruction for living. He says, essentially, it's not about power. It's not about position or having control. That's the way the world works, Jesus says. We see this in the structures set up for rule by the Gentiles. And now I'm done paraphrasing. Let's just read his actual words. But that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. A lot of your translations probably say to give his life as a ransom for many. Tim Keller, in his book King's Cross, and responding to this section of Mark, he writes that the heart of the gospel is all about giving up power, pouring out resources, and serving the center of Christianity is always migrating away from power and wealth. This is an important truth for us as believers as we choose those who we allow to influence us. Jesus' words first by a mile, but somewhere way down the list, Tim Keller's words too. Jesus served. 
Jesus chose last place. Jesus came not as a conquering king, but as a humble healer. Jesus listened to words and to the heart. And no matter what he heard, he moved with grace and he moved with truth. Okay, so there's, there's James and John, that little section. So hold on to that for a moment. And we're going to explore the other scene where we see Jesus' same question. It's been a bit, so let's read this again. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet. But he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, Call him forward. They called the blind man. Be encouraged. Get up. He's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, to the side he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, Go. Your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see. And he began to follow Jesus on the way. So blind Bartimaeus. He's not blind anymore. We're just going to call him Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? How might a blind man who was being pushed aside and likely was very used to being pushed aside answer a question like this? Would we expect to encounter him a spirit of desperation? Maybe one of submission, perhaps one of hope, maybe some doubt mixed in there. Certainly humility, because no one can actually make themselves see. And I also want you to notice that he's not pushing himself through the crowd here. He was sitting beside the road, I'm going to assume simply in his spot, and he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming. What must this have been like for him? Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that man is here. The one that heals people. The one who some say is more than just a man. The one who spits on the eyes of blind people. Oh, well, some spit is probably worth it if I can see if he will heal me. Oh, please, will he notice me? Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Used to being scolded being told to move aside, be quiet, get out of the way. I imagine his desperation or his felt last hope drove him to shout all the more, show me mercy. Now I'll come back to these folks that are trying to push him aside in a moment, but for now let's marvel at this sense of neediness. Now this is not the clingy kind of neediness that we often try, each of us probably, to, to get away from. This is the real stuff. Like, I need to be met by Jesus in my condition, or I have no hope. Do you feel the way that Bartimaeus did? When we gather on Sundays, does it feel to you like we come to Jesus with this posture? Do we collectively or individually even know that we are blind? Where are we blind? Or are we more concerned with our status amongst one another? Are we angling for position, either in the church or with our personal ideas being put out into the world as, they, as if they're the only ones worth considering? Are you, are we, am I, James and John? Or are we Bartimaeus? I don't know about you, but I'm both. Remember, no one of us is all one thing. It's an important consideration, by the way. The next time you're encouraged externally or tempted internally to vilify someone who sees or thinks or experiences life differently than you do. But wherever you may relate most strongly this morning on that spectrum, we need to look beyond ourselves to Christ. What does he do? In both cases, he listens to the heart, he sees the need, and he offers a specific grace. In the case of James and John, he shows them that the pathway to greatness, to the abundant life, is to take up last place, to follow him in what he did, to follow him in how he lived. In the case of Bartimaeus, he heals his vision according to his faith, and the result is that a new disciple begins following. Verse 52, at once he was able to see, and he, Bartimaeus, began to follow Jesus on the way. Not an unimportant detail. Both are grace. Both are grace. So maybe 
two ways to apply this this morning. The first would be the conventional application. Something that says something like, don't have a heart like James and John here, rather have a heart like Bartimaeus. And for the most part, I would affirm that, despite my apparently sarcastic delivery. But if I can also refer back to our discussion on the soils from a few weeks ago, it's not always so possible to pursue God in the way that we should if the soil of our hearts is not good. If we're interrupted by hard paths, rocky ground, thorny plants. When the soil is good, sure, I'll move toward Jesus like Bartimaeus with humility and submission. But when the soil is not so good, I might rather move in arrogance or entitlement or seeking power or control. So given this reality that we all have, if we're being honest with ourselves this morning, let me offer another application that I sense may help us at a more formational level. It's this. Answer Jesus' question. Answer Jesus' question. What do you want me to do for you? But here's the catch. Answer it honestly. Not with shoulds, not with self-deception, not with theologically correct answers, not with what you think God wants to hear from you. Answer it honestly. And when you do, you may or may not like the answer that spills from your soul. It might, may lean toward James and John. It may lean toward Bartimaeus. But really, it will probably have shades of both. Answer it honestly. Hear yourself. Examine the conditions on which your answer is based and ask the Holy Spirit what it is that he wants you to notice in your desire. I don't know what you want. And I don't know the specifics of how Jesus will respond. But wherever you are and whatever you hear, I can guarantee you his response will be rooted in his grace toward you. He may instruct. He may affirm. He may convict he may guide, he may heal, he may correct, he may even be silent for a bit, but there will be grace. Now, does this not sound like the heart behind a passage that many of us know well from the very end of Psalm 139, where David writes, examine me, God, look at my heart, put me to the test, know my anxious thoughts, look to see if there is any idolatrous way in me, and then lead me on an eternal path the eternal path. Now, I've got to wrap this up and ideally connect this to our effort to bring some of our local partner ministries to your attention today. This, to me, feels like my biggest challenge. Anyway, a few minutes ago, I said I would come back to the people trying to push Bartimaeus aside and to prevent him from, I guess, bothering Jesus. We aren't told directly that these are Jesus' disciples they may have been, but they may simply have been part of the crowd as Jesus was passing through. I don't know. Earlier in chapter 10, we see the disciples doing something very similar, and we know it's them. Now, we didn't read this yet, but let's take a look. We're jumping back to verse 13 and 14 in Mark 10. People were bringing children to Jesus so that he would bless them, but the disciples scolded them. When Jesus saw this, he grew angry and said to them, Allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them, because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. In both instances, with the children being brought to Jesus and with Bartimaeus, Jesus rebukes or dismisses the gatekeepers that are working to manage who gets to encounter him. In verse 14 here, Jesus grows angry. Now, can I be very blunt with you, very direct? I hate this. In the disciples and in the crowd, and when I see it in my own life, I hate this. Like Jesus, this kind of thing makes me grow angry too. Jesus seeks the least. In these cases, children and a blind beggar, and he elevates them to direct relationship with him. Jesus is not looking for gatekeepers or advanced operatives or spin room managers. Jesus is not looking for handlers. He's looking for the very people that those kinds of folks often tend to push aside. Now, I bring this to our attention today. One, because I think it's very easy to miss this with all of the other things happening in Mark 10 but because I believe we need to be very mindful of how this can happen. As it was a risk with his first disciples, and even among the crowd, that 
to their credit, did ultimately encourage Bartimaeus to come forward. It is a risk with us. We serve a God who invites without discrimination, without prerequisite, so we must likewise extend the invitation simply to Jesus, not to our own ideas, not to our own preferences, not to our own ideologies or to our own cultures, but to Jesus himself, simply Jesus, no and. Jesus will handle those things that are yet to be understood, as in the case of the children. He will handle those things that need to be healed, as in the case of Bartimaeus. Our job is not to gatekeep. Our job is to swing wide the gate that leads to Jesus. And this will, this must include all, all of us, all of the least, the lost, the overlooked, and the assumed disinterested. I want King Street to be known as a church that welcomes the children as they come. I want us to be the first to make a way for the blind beggar to encounter Jesus. May we never stand in the way of those Jesus is seeking. And may we examine the ways that we may be tempted to do so. Me, you, all of us together. So here's the connection to Local Partner Sunday. We are partners in this community with folks who are in no way gatekeepers. Folks whose passion is to offer an invitation to Jesus to the least, the lost, and the hardest places in our community. Our partners are working among the poor, among the disabled, among the trafficked, among the unhoused, among the children and students, among the immigrant communities, among those labeled as hopeless or spiritually disinterested. Jesus loves these ones, all of them. And we are able as a church to resist gatekeeping, staying in line with the heart of Christ, offering invitation to all by partnering with those best equipped and specifically called to live and work in the trenches. It is my hope that more and more of us will join in this work, serving, praying, giving. Inside of our walls, with groups like Once More Ministries and Reset and Agape English and the After School Ministry, and outside of our walls, with those that we have heard from today and more. I want to end our time this morning hearing from two more of our partners. One who invites those in our migrant farmer community to see Jesus, and another who lives the way of Jesus into athletes at a local university. Hello, my name is Christian Aguilar. And I'm Jimena Suarez. Uh, We are leading uh, Fruit Belt Farm Worker Christian Ministry. This is a mission here in Franklin County, Adams and Cumberland, reaching out over 25 migrant workers coming every year uh, to uh, these three counties. Um, They are separate in more than 400 camps. So we have a big mission and, and also uh, sharing the gospel. But I think the most important thing that we are doing right now is uh, b- a building and, and creating like a, a good a partnership with local churches. Our mission also is to just, um, you know, be with uh, migrant workers, not just with them, but with the families. Uh, recently, we uh, have open a division for family and and women so we're trying to to reach as much as we can um as as we know them and see their needs um like he said you know normally they spend most of the time here in the united states not knowing anybody they feel isolated they feel lonely and they need someone who can just go there visit them play games and just have fun so they can feel like uh, they're not alone uh, at the same time, we are uh, sharing Jesus. I think this is the m- main and the most important aspect that we do. Uh, every time we, we have a, like a, a, a strong time of prayer with them, and that is the time that we can get together as one. Because even if you don't know Spanish or Creole or perfect English, we can get together to pray for all kind of needs. So please join us in prayer. And and, um, if 
anything uh, of this ministry uh, moves your heart, just reach, reach to us and then we'll be happy to go with you and, and share what we're doing. Tenemos el corazón de amar a Dios y amar al prójimo. So we have a heart of loving God and loving our, our neighbor. Uh, creemos que en general existe un énfasis muy grande por amar a Dios. We believe that there's a big emphasis in loving God. Y estamos tratando de que la iglesia sea un poco más fuerte en amar mejor al prójimo. And we're trying uh, helping the church to make loving God a little bit more stronger. Loving the neighbor. I mean loving neighbor. Okay. I was listening to you. Okay. <laughs> eh, y hace tres años solamente teníamos tres iglesias visitando a los trabajadores migrantes. So three years ago we have um, a few churches visiting the migrant workers. Ahora tenemos más de 30. Now we have more than 30. Eso quiere decir de que hay un anhelo de poder conocer mejor a tu comunidad. So that means that there is a desire uh, for you to know your community. Doy gracias a Dios por, por esta iglesia. And we give thanks to, church for, uh, to God for this church. Porque han sido una respuesta a mis oraciones. Because you guys been an uh, answer to our prayers. No es fácil estar solo. It's not easy to be alone. Pero aquí me siento en familia. But we do feel as a family. Amar a Dios. Loving God. Y amar al prójimo. And loving our neighbor. Hello, my name is Jason Pegel, and I work for the CCO, which is the Coalition for Christian Outreach, uh, partnered with the Uncommon Board here in our community. One way I've seen, I've seen God work in our campus ministry this past year is in December, um, I have an opportunity to lead a group called Fight Group on campus. It's our football team Bible study. And we had three guys graduate or transition on after the semester in December. And I took the time during our fight group, our last one of the semester, to, uh, to honor the seniors or honor the graduates. And I gave the rest of the group an opportunity if they wanted to, to um, share something about each one of the guys that was graduating. And I didn't know who was gonna share, who wasn't gonna share. Um, and every guy in the room, there was about 12 guys, every guy in the room shared something about the graduates. Um, some of the guys were crying at the end. Some of the guys uh, shared with me afterwards they'd never encountered anything like that before, a way to be honored and celebrated. Because for most athletes, when they're on the field, they get torn down or they get criticized or made fun of or told that they're not doing something good enough. So that was a really cool opportunity just to see God work in the lives of some of the guys at Shippensburg University's football team. Um, so just wanted to say thank you so much for your partnership. Thanks for giving and praying to help make this happen. There's so much more where that came from. I just, we just don't have time to show it all to you today. But it is, it is my prayer, it is our prayer, it's the prayer of the local outreach commission that, that, that shepherds and leads and partners uh, directly with these partners that you would want to know more. And the opportunities for your Sunday school class or your L3 group to get together and to actually go serve. You know, boots on the ground kind of serve, especially with the Fruit Belt farm workers. Um, they, you can take 8, 10, 12 people and eat and play games with, with migrant farmers and love on them and help them feel welcome into our community. Just one example. So if you want to know more, about any of these or the, the many that we didn't really have time to highlight today, uh, reach out to me, let me know. I would be glad to get you connected into how, the, you, how you can be involved in this part of what God has called King Street to do to engage and bless our community with the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for these partners. We're grateful for our community. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your presence among us today. God, would you help us to see the ways that you are working to come to you wondering how can we join you in what it is that you are doing. Lord, to see the conditions of our hearts and to know what it is that you want us to notice. To be free with offering invitation to you to all of those in our lives, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we serve. Lord, we want to be a people known for inviting others to know you. Into salvation into the abundant life, into the kingdom living, into the way of Christ. Lord, so help move us there. Spur our hearts. Spur our feet. Spur our wallets. Lord, you can do this. 
and we ask you for your help. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood, I now am saved. If you've experienced that this morning, let's sing it out. Receive this blessing as you go out today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Church, God bless each one of you today and this week. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. If you're joining us today for the first time, we hope you choose to worship with us again next week. We are looking forward to continuing our Are You Ready sermon series in the Gospel of Mark as we lead up to Easter and Resurrection Sunday. We would love to make a special connection with you, our online family this Easter season, in the tangible form of an Easter card from your King Street Church family. We just need to know where to send it. If you feel comfortable, would you please fill out the connection form at kingstreetchurch.com slash Easter card. That's all one word, Easter card and we will place your card in the mail. Here at King Street Church, we have three core values, being spiritually alive in Christ, relationally connected by Christ, and missionally engaged for Christ. And we would like to take this time to highlight our first core value, being spiritually alive in Christ. This core value asks the question, who am I worshiping? Everyone engages in worship, and worship is more than just singing songs. Worship means to ascribe worth to something or someone. We can worship money, status, sports teams, etc. We believe that true biblical worship turns that affection to God, to who he is, and what he has done for us. And the essence of true worship is our response from the heart to value God above all earthly things. This is defined by the priority we place on who God is in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities. Not just one or two days a week, but every day of the week. If you have an interest in joining us becoming more spiritually alive together, a practical application that we encourage you to participate in is our daily Bible reading plan as we go through the New Testament together in 2024. You can receive this digitally to your phone by texting DAILY to 717-401-7777, or you can visit kingstreetchurch.com Bible to sign up for email delivery or download the full year's reading schedule. We are so grateful for our church family, and you are an important part of it. 
Thanks again for being here with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you next week. together strangers neighbors are blood in his children of generations of every nation of so don't let your heart be troubled
the truest friend Staying through the night when I was at my end Comforting my heart till it was light again All oh, this is a faithful kind of love You are the father.